well, to summarize it, uh, the translation and localization working group uh, goes a little bit beyond translation, which is the, the only, it's only for translating the text itself, something a machine can do. While localization takes this a step further by employing multiple techniques to adapt the content's full meaning for a different culture, ultimately achieving what we call internationalization. And so there are many systems um, that help automate this process. It can be very thorough, very costly. And a lot of people need to spend a lot of time on this to get to a final result. So to us, to help us with that, to aid us with that, there, there are translation management systems that help this process from the beginning of the translation process until the finished product. And then it, uh, the one we use called Crowdin has also a connection with uh, an integration with GitHub that's very important for open source projects. So it, it makes uh, sense in the context of the Turn Away, whose website is hosted on GitHub, to use a tool like that. Well, um, these are some team members with different roles. Uh, Batu, Andrea, Andrea, and I are the translation and localization co-leads, but other folks lead language-specific efforts as well. Um, here's also some pictures of folks that have worked on the Turkish and Spanish translations, but it's a, a larger group of people. Just every, not, not everybody would fit in a slide only so quickly. Uh, we have established this workflow in Crowdin. Uh, and the reason we we use it not is not just because of the support to open source software um, and communities, but also because they they're very they listen to to our concerns. They they uh, are a very interactive platform. They're maintainers, and also they support right to left languages such as Arabic, for example. So we also have a GitHub organization account for the translation, and we document our work there too. Our uh, translation relies on crowdsourcing and volunteers, so it's important to keep consistency in the translation. So any language-specific rules are actually recorded uh, in this uh, GitHub organization account that I just mentioned, and using the language itself. So for example, Arabic rules are written in Arabic to make it more accessible and useful to a uh, wider audience, even outside the Turing Way community. Uh, there's also a translation memory, which uh, keeps recording the terms we use frequently, and we can share that with other projects. So if your community is interested in sharing this memory, we can help you with that too. A glossary as well is available. So besides the translation itself, this is what we've been doing. Um, there is a chapter that we uh, published in the community handbook of the Turing Way. Uh, it well, well, the handbook itself shares the information about all our practices in the project, right? The ways of work and other aspects that uh, sustain the community participation and make it equitable for all members. Um, but well, we have this specific section where uh, we explain how to use it, that platform crowd in and, and how we uh, have our little translation workflow. And uh, in the documentation, we we not only document the technical aspects for newcomers, but also non-technical details for anybody who wants to read, to, to lead co-working calls, to periodically review the translations in their organization. So we hope that other communities can reuse these practices. And um, well, I already talked about the language specific doc uh, documentation, but here you have an example of the Arabic one. Well, everyone is welcome to join this effort or to reuse our approach. Uh, there are many ways to support this group apart from translation in Crowdin. You can review what's uh, ongoing, some ongoing translation in your language, in your preferred language. You can uh, read the published versions of the book, so the translated versions of it to see if, it, if there is anything that could be different or to suggest any improves improvements and you can contribute by promoting this project to your community. You can get in touch with us anytime as well. And our next co-working calls will happen a little bit in a little bit of a different schedule than usual. They are normally uh, every couple of weeks, but this time we're gonna have the next two ones on the two upcoming Wednesdays. We'll be mostly focusing on governance, but anyone is welcome to bring their thoughts and their questions. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Melissa. Bravo, seeing some, oops, seeing some um, um, emoji reactions in the chat um, and on Zoom, amazing, amazing. Um, thank you so much. We're gonna zoom through, through the presentations um, just so that we have uh, time for folks to be able to um, ask questions towards the end. Um, but in the meantime, can I pass over to the Book Dash working group? Thank you. Uh, that's me and Ariel as well. Can you hear me okay? So we're in the room. Brilliant. Let me just share my screen. So hello everybody. Um, obviously I'm going to be, oh we look a bit frozen. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Um, uh, I'm going to be talking about the Book Dash Working Group. Um, so the Working Group um, uh, is a very new working group, um, and our members at the moment are Ariel uh, Bennett, who's our Program Manager at Tools, Practices and Systems, who's going to be speaking in a minute. Myself, um, who is, um, oh dear, I think I'm having problems. Um, can you share my screen? Oh, you want me to share my screen? Yes, please. My, I think it's the Turing system Wi Fi. Yeah, that's here. Oh, my goodness. You can still hear me. Lovely. Here we go. Thank you. Take it away. Oh, it is. I was, no. I will stand up. Oh, right. Are we having a problem? So, if you can still hear me, give me a thumbs up, Ariel. Yeah, and I'll stand up because then you can see me on the camera, hopefully. So, we've got Ariel, uh, who's our program manager in Tools, Practices, and Systems. And we have also got uh, myself, who I'm a community manager at the Turing. So we are kind of representing the Turing staff on the working group. <laughs> and then we've got um, we've got um, Carlos, um, who uh, Martinez, who is a community manager from Netherlands eSight Centre. Um, we've got Esther um, Plomp, who is a data steward from TU Delft uh, University, and Susanna, um, who is a PhD student from the University of Edinburgh. Um, to be on the working group, um, so the working group was initiated in January uh, this year, so it's very new. Uh, we're still developing the roles. So far, we have made decisions that Esther is going to be the chair. She's basically taking responsibility for us. Um, and we've got myself and Ariel who are taking responsibility for documenting things at the moment. And then Carlos and Susanna are sort of, we're calling them ordinary members of the working group, but we may well develop other roles um, as we go along. We have also developed, because um, we want to be completely transparent from the beginning, so we've started a repository called Bookdash, um, and all of the um, information about our meetings and more information about the working group is can be found there now, because we're, we're documenting as we go along. Um, just so you know, um, to be a per person uh, on the working group, you have to have had a long-term um, connection and attendance uh, and uh, work on uh, the book dash. So that could be uh, attending the book dash, then going on to actually being on the planning committee and then actually then moving forward to us now forming the working group. Um, so I'll pass over to Ariel for the next slide. Great, yeah, uh, thanks Emma. Um, yeah, we're excited to uh, expand the working group in the future um, and also see how we evolve. At the moment, uh, we're centering the purpose of the Book Dash working group around long term strategic decisions for this style of event. Um, so that's making sure that from Book Dash to Book Dash, um, feedback is implemented. Um, you know, if we uh, if the feedback from attendees is, oh, we should do more of this or we should hire a llama then this is uh, our purview to say um, yes or no, or like that makes sense. Let's look into that for next time to kind of help keep that continuity between book dashes. Um, we're also going to be responsible for reviewing the planning committee applications, um, working with the planning committee to deliver the book dash events, um, helping to report on the book dash, and then also making sure that the Turing Way community handbook for the book dash is updated and, and up to date. 
Sarah, thank you. But if you could open an issue on the book uh, repo around uh, live animals as guests, that was very, for those of you that um, it was very common for uh, people to hire uh, animals for events to appear on Zoom um, during the uh during the pandemic in particular um, and it was a massive hit so we might look into that in the future if we've got the budget um obviously previously there was just the the book dash planning committee um and we've had a lot of questions about what's the difference between the working group and the um planning committee um and so as you see on the on the left hand side we've got the book dash working group um looking at long-term strategic decisions as i just mentioned um, and then the planning committee is tailored to each individual book dash. Um, those are the individuals who are going to be reviewing book dash applications from participants, um, giving feedback to applications, either those that were selected or not, helping participants to connect up with each other, um, planning different sessions for the book dashes, um, and then hosting, running and facilitating different sessions throughout the event. So the, the working group is for continuity across the different events. And then the planning committee is focused on delivering a specific event and making sure that it's awesome and has the sessions that you want to, to have in it. Um, and then also looking at collating feedback after the event. Um, we're very excited actually to announce on this call that we have settled the dates of the next book dash. This is the other uh, uh, thing we've kind of um, landed on as a responsibility of the working group. This will be the 3rd to the 7th of June 2024. It's slightly later than previous years where it's been held in May, but we hope you can all still make it. Uh, we're also launching applications to be on the planning committee today, and I think uh, Emma or somebody can host it, can share those links in the chat. If you are interested in helping to plan the next book dash, that would be amazing. Um, we want to have a really diverse set of people um, on the committee this time. Uh, it would be lovely. Um, and we're also opening today uh, applications if you are thinking about running an in-person hub as well. So if you would like support to coalesce a group of people um, geographically in your area, um, now's the time to say, yes, please, I would like some help with that. And we want to coordinate with you. Um, if you've got any questions on that, I can highly recommend talking to Carlos or Esther, who both successfully organized in-person hubs, um, or Anne, who uh, helps to coordinate our in-person hub that happens in London. Um, I think those are the folks who are on the call who have previously organized uh, in-person hubs. Um, submission deadline is the 1st of March. Um, and so we'd encourage you to get your applications in soon. Um, and this is because the book dash is in June. And when you sort of work back, uh, we need to, we're getting moving on this. Um, so really excited to see where the book dash working group takes us. Um, if you've got any questions or thoughts or ideas, please do open an issue on our repository. We would love to have feedback and thoughts from the community about how to shape these events going forward. Thank you. Fantastic, lots of emoji reactions. Thanks so much, Emma and Ariel. Um, really great to also learn more about the work that you all are doing and to see just how much is evolving in the Book Dash, which is our like core community event that happens twice a year. Um, huge announcements for sure. Okay, so um, it looks like we're having some trouble with um, Liz from the Accessibility Working Group able to join the call. She seems to be stuck in a kind of registration loop at the moment. So maybe just in the interest of time, um, how about we can start with the round of questions that folks have um, for uh, Melissa, for Emma, for Ariel, um, on all things related to the translation process um, or, uh, or our book dash. Um, working group as well. Um, maybe we can get started. I am currently, if you'd like to add a note, um, a written note or a written question, you can also add them to our shared pad starting on line 75, where we have some notes that we're adding here, um, but you're also free to raise your hand. And yes, great flag, Emma. The book dash dates are 3rd to the 7th of June. 
I'm going to ask this question specifically to the localization and translation working group. What has been the biggest challenge onboarding new people into the group? And what do you think they struggle the most with in, in terms of like the massive amount of work you all have done? Do they find it easy to navigate? Do they require a lot of time? Yeah, so maybe it's a sneaky question because I know it's not easy. <laughs> I think so. Thank you, Malvika, for your question. I think something that always comes up is where do I start? Uh, because the book is very long, right? So, and, and which is a good thing. But yeah, they, they always ask because, uh, you know, I, I want to start with a small piece. What do I do? So, we, for to answer that question, what we have is a sort of a, a priority table of uh, things that should be translated first or reviewed first, and then we move on to the more to the more complex ones. For example, the the foreword, the, the the little sections in the beginning and the end of the book are, uh, let's say, a low hanging fruit, and then we we let people continue from there, and they can either choose a chapter that they feel like they would be happy translating or reviewing the translation and or we can help them uh, find something that needs uh, some some care some love and care to continue translating I have a follow-up question and folks I don't want to hog the whole call please do ask questions but um, you all have quite a strong group of people who are leading on specific translation. So there's there's like a decentralized leadership within the decentralized leadership. Um, how do you how do you make decisions? And what kind of, you know, if other working group are trying to adopt the same governance as the localization, yeah, where should they start? That's going to be what we're going to be discussing in these next two polls that I commented and probably after that too, because governance processes take a long time, right? Several months. Um, I don't, I wouldn't say we have a, a defined structure right now. Like we know that this is the way we always make decisions, but uh, we, also, we, all, we always bring uh, anything that, that requires this, this, you know, communication, this decision making to these uh, co-working calls to the synchronous meetings and then we we discuss you know every aspect of what we have to do for example I need to present in a in an event or you know uh, I don't know we need to change the leadership because someone is doesn't have the bandwidth anymore uh, also the on Slack we communicate these things like you know I'm not available I don't think I can uh, share an opinion on this because it's just not my expertise so uh, this it's a little unstructured right now. Uh, we already sort of talked about how maybe like you know a more strict way of voting might not be adequate because not always the same set of people is in every call and they aren't always active on Slack either. So we will probably need something a little uh, more un unstructured, but you know that actually led leads us to a final decision. So there will be news about this, and of course, we're going to share everything with the group. Thanks so much, Malvika, and thanks so much, Melissa. Um, it is super inspiring um, to echo Malvika's note in the chat um, to see the work that you all are doing. And especially kind of embodying that decentralization that we are also really in many ways kind of taking cues from you all too in how to decentralize our, our own work. So maybe to get um, started. All right. So, okay, so the first slide is uh, just a uh, title and some yeah. contact information and we will um, We will encourage people to get in touch if you're interested in getting involved or if you have any questions. Uh, right. and, Going to the next slide. Uh, so we are, then the second slide, uh, we are a collaboration of community members that want to enhance the accessibility of both the Turing Way book and the process of making the book in the community. Um, Anne and I have been co-leads uh, up until 
now when I think we're going to be talking about uh, changes in the way working groups are governed. Um, Andrea Sanchez Tapia provided a lot of um, initial momentum to this as far as um, talking about who things are accessible for, why we do it in particularly the social rather than, than just the technical aspects. Uh, Sophia Bachelor has written a chapter on inclusive events for people with lived experience participating in research. Um, and we have been collaborating with a great group called Metadocencia, which is uh, described more on the next slide. Um, they make the production communication of uh, yeah, it's a long paragraph here that was provided by Patricia Lotto, who um, has been working with us. Um, and it's a, a great organization that uh, is bringing open science to particularly Spanish and a little bit to Portuguese speaking communities in Latin America. Meta has provided great examples of how we can set expectations for accessibility and inclusion and guidelines to actually how to do that. They've been participating, participating in uh, uh, book dashes to mm -hmm. help us kind of lay the groundwork for um, making inclusive content and community and um, also to review the chapter on inclusive events for people with lived experiences and lots of helpful conversations about who the target populations are and how we want to uh, interact with them. And then the next slide. Um, what is accessibility? Um, Andrea Sanchez Tapia gave us a great definition that it's a set of community-wide behavioral, social, and technical decisions that we make to make sure that people with disabilities are welcome. Um, but we also want to define it more broadly because there are other barriers like uh, time zones, language, which is also probably just been addressed really well in the translation and localization uh, presentation, uh, low bandwidth, people who have child and elder care responsibilities. Um, these are all people that we can think about having having practices in our community to uh, lower barriers for their participation. Um, the next slide. Um, some examples, it's used in a lot of ways. Uh, and it's, as far as the disability specific, some examples are uh, making sure that materials are accessible with the screen reader, uh, providing live captions of technical meetings, meaning that actual human beings are doing the captioning uh, so that there aren't as many errors as the AI kind, um, avoiding un unnecessary cognitive complexity in materials, providing frequent breaks. There are lots and lots of others uh, that we're hoping to be documenting. And then in the broader sense, again, um, it has to do with uh, materials that can be accessed with lower bandwidth, not using uh, communication apps that take a, a whole lot of uh, internet juice. Um, we want to make materials that will still be accessible to people on older devices. There are even uh, some people in some parts of the world that use their phones because uh, they don't have computers um, and considering worldwide time zones. And the next slide is about the projects we have going. Um, we are drafting an accessibility policy for the Turing Way. Um, we are planning and going to be writing a new guide for accessibility. Uh, there are links on these slides. I'll put the, the, um, the web address for the slides in, in the chat afterwards. Um, but there are links to our, our plans on GitHub, Guide to Accessibility, um, Sophia Bachelor's chapter on inclusive events for people with lived experience. Um, 
which it turns out has a lot of overlap with the accessibility topic. Um, we have worked with the Book Dash and other event organizers to remove barriers for participation. Um, and we keep learning all the time, of course, about how to remove more barriers for different populations. And the next slide is, uh, we would like to encourage you to join us. There are some different kinds of ways you can help. Um, you can write content for the, if you have a, an area of expertise in accessibility, um, you have actual experience having a disability, it would be great to have uh, contributions from people with uh, specific areas of, of expertise. Um, you can review the uh, progress on the uh, accessible events chapter for people with lived disability. Um, you can educate us um, as a team on uh, ways that we can improve accessibility and, and also the broader sense of inclusion and what what things we can do to to make people welcome. You can attend our monthly accessibility working group meetings, which are uh, in the afternoons on the second Monday of every month on uh, yeah, the the you can you can check that out on the um, Turingway calendar. Um, you can also participate in the accessibility channel on the Turingway Slack. Um, and the next slide is just uh, how to contact Anne and I um, if you have questions or want to get involved. And we'd really love to see people uh, help us. Uh, we have a great opportunity to teach the whole open science community about how to reduce barriers for all different kinds of people and, and uh, you know, continue the um, the way that open science kind of flattens things and, and reduces formal hierarchies. Um, I think I think we can continue that with with more inclusion. Um, thanks. Thanks so much, Liz. Um, adding in some, there's lots of emoji reactions um, on people's Zoom squares. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you so much for your, uh, your flexibility and calm as you're facing all the issues with Zoom. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Um, and thanks so much for telling us sure. more about the accessibility working group. All right. Um, just so you know, folks, uh, the links to all of the slide decks um, for reference are all linked in our notes pad um, starting on line 27. Um, maybe we can start here, um, kind of go back to maybe a short bit of question and answer for folks, starting off with this, um, is how has working in a formalized way or um, in a formalized way through this kind of working group format uh, um, affected your uh, relationship with the Turing Way project? How has it changed uh, the way that you think about the Turing Way? Or how has it changed the way that you relate to the topics that you're working on? I'd like to say one more thing about the topic. Um, you know, it's just part of accessibility is, is disability, but really, I guess this is true about any um, kind of difference um, that it's, it's really difficult for people to talk about it and ask questions about it. And we hope this can be a comfortable place for people to, to ask the questions. Um, but back to Anne's question, um, I have, participated in three book dashes so far. Um, and one of the recent changes that I think has been productive is that uh, we uh, have added a, a structure, an idea that um, 
we're going to use the collaborative cafes as time to do our work. And that has helped me a whole lot to not like focus real hard during the book dash and then kind of slack off for six months until the next book dash. I think that's it for me. Thanks, Liz. Definitely, there's a very different cadences that folks, um, I think, engage in book dashes and they're working on these sprints um, and then they come back, you know, twice a year um, working at the collaboration cafes, which is definitely one of my favorite spaces in the community. Um, really kind of changes the way in which you, you work and, in, and engage. Um, Ariel, I saw your hand was up first, so maybe I can pass to you and then to Jim. Uh, actually, it was Jim's hand up first. Sorry, you go first. Okay, I'll go first. Um, I think about the uh, about accessibility. You know, I thought it was really interesting to hear what you said about Liz about um, hoping that the Turing Way can as sort of become an example of what good or I suppose, you know at least better accessibility looks like. And I think that's one of the nice things about the Turing Way that it it sort of demonstrates how we think things should be. Um, and that made me wonder, I, I don't know if you've thought or planned sort of what support you need from everyone else. So if if the accessibility working group can come up with a sort of policy that says this this is the gold standard, this is what we should aim for, is there like what's the mechanism to try and encourage or push everyone to sort of follow that? And I don't know if you thought about other working groups maybe what they can do to sort of contribute to, to that goal. That's a really good question. Um, I think, um, again, I invite anybody to participate in our working group. Um, even if you think you don't know, you can learn and that learning can help everybody. Um, I think I would hope that um, accessibility touches everything. So I would hope that if say the infrastructure working group had questions about accessibility that, that they could ask us. Um, and I think um, we will try to make the community aware as we uh, get the guide in writing, um, try to make the community aware of, of what aspects of it are relevant to them. Sounds like maybe there's, uh, similar to how the translation and localization the infrastructure folks are recently collaborating, on developing infrastructure for language support. Sounds like maybe Jim, if you'd like to hop on over to um, to the accessibility working groups meetings, maybe that can be a space too, where we can talk more about that as well. Thanks so much. Um, Ariel, pass to you. And I know we're just at the 50s, so make it quick before we go on a little bit of a break. Yeah, so I, sorry, I'm super quick. I was um, just gonna respond to your question about um, working groups, I think, it's uh it feels quite empowering to be part of a group tasked with um sort of continuously developing kind of events and how the community engages with them and to bring really like a sense of, of uh like learning the lessons and and iterating over time um that you kind of need a consistent group for so i'm pretty excited about that um and the changes that we might be able to make or, you know, just the, even the formatting and improvements for, for how things are done. So that's that's me really quick. Um, and then we can go to break. Thanks, Ariel. Um, and we can break unless, Melissa, would you like to try? I have a really thing? brief one. I have a really brief oh, one. Yeah, go for it, go for it. Add alt texts to your images. 
Ariel's giving over a heart. Alex is sending over a thumbs up. Kirsty as well. <laughs> Melissa as well. Malvika with 100%. Don with a heart. <laughs> Hearts all around for all text, indeed. Okay, so <laughs> we are going to break um, for now for the next uh, 10 minutes. Um, we'll come right before the top of the hour. Um, and then we have a presentation that we'll be passing off to Kirsty. Um, the slide says decision making in the Turing way. And um, I I have a picture on the next slide that's showing now, which it says my job title, which is the research program director for tools, practices and systems. And it's got a picture of me standing outside the Turing Institute in the British Library in London with my then um, one year old and my now nearly two year old is going to be coming home from um, nursery. She's very, very cute. She was cute then. She's cute now. And I'm going to flip on to the next slide that um, many of you will have seen a million times before that the Turing Way is an open source book project that involves and supports a diverse research community in ensuring that reproducible and ethical data science is accessible and comprehensible for everyone. And you'll all know that uh, we have five different guides at the moment, uh, thinking about collaboration, project design, reproducibility, communication and outreach, and ethics considerations. And then we also have the community handbook, which is our kind of guide for how we work together to write these five different guides. And on the next slide, <clears throat> there's an illustration, uh, which we had a, done by Scriberia at one of the book dashes of me uh, sitting in a, in a coffee shop, writing on a scroll of paper, because the story goes that when I designed the Turing Way, uh, there were no laptops allowed in the coffee shop in Berlin, where I was, where I was working. And so I sat down with my pe colored pens and my note paper, and I reflected on my personal experiences of the file drawer effect. So the fact that sort of uh, research that doesn't align with previously published research tends to go in a fly file drawer and isn't sort of shared for others to learn from. The lack of reproducibility across my PhD and postdoc area of neuroimaging, but actually across literally e almost everything. Um, thinking a lot about sort of imposter syndrome around coding, the fact that if I look back now, I'm pretty good, pretty sure I was actually very good at coding in my post, in my PhD. Uh, but I never thought I was. I thought that there was sort of like some sort of magical barrier against which you, you once you pass that, you were good at coding. And actually, it turns out that just trying lots of things and Googling lots of questions is essentially the way to become very good at coding. I was reflecting as well about how lonely uh, sort of research can be and pairing that up with the fact that there's a huge amount of wasted time in um, in doing work because you don't learn from others, because you don't have those opportunities to see where they have had challenges and you can benefit from their work. And then I personally still get very, very frustrated about the hypocrisy of academia and thinking about sort of how every, every paper in psychiatry, which was where I did my postdoc, uh, starts by saying mental health is a huge challenge and we should really pay attention to it. And yet, the work environment of those people who were writing those papers was exacerbating major mental health challenges. So this is sort of, these were the seeds of the beginning of the Turing Way. And I want to flip to the next slide, which has a quote on it. And this is actually a slide from a talk, a longer talk that I gave recently. And I've kept the Zenodo link down at the bottom there um, to that slide. It was for some PhD students about how we can get better at coding in the open. Um, and the quote is, is pulled from this history of request for comments uh, from ARPANET, which was the sort of precursor to the internet. And in this, in this history, this guy, Stephen Croker, talks about how no one knew the answers. Everyone was sort of throwing out some good ideas and capturing sort of some thoughts. And the quote on the slide says, anyone could say anything and nothing was official. And to emphasize the point, I labeled the notes request for comments. And that's the beginning of sort of a, a way of working that's very common across open source communities where really everyone is invited to participate in kind of making plans. Now on the next slide, I have uh, a, a, a a sort of illustration here of the fact that Git is your um, very useful open source tool that allows you to version control what you're working on. Oh, you're back. You're back. Yeah, I'm back. I'm back. Thank you. Thanks for interrupting me. So 
I'm on this slide on accountability through openness. And the reason that I wanted to talk about this today is because actually the reason that we use GitHub in the Turing way is to try to have more inclusion in the decision-making and the co-creation of the book, and also to kind of track the accountability of how decisions are made. So one of the things that we can do with accountability through openness is document requests for input in issues and decisions that are somewhere easy to find. We can be very clear about communication channels, writing down decisions and actions after we have conversations about them. And we do a lot of work and a lot of people in this call will be very expert around thinking about planning for misunderstandings and managing disagreements, both in terms of having an appropriate code of conduct, but also in having spaces where people are able to then meaningfully input into, into discussions. And what I wanted to sort of propose to all of you and, and have a, I'm very curious to hear your thoughts about is a three tiered sort of um, decision making kind of model. So the largest wedge uh, is the community level, and that is the GitHub level. That is anyone who complies with our project's code of conduct can participate in the decision making for those types of um, actions in the Turing way. So you are already doing it. You're here. You take part in you know, conversations in issues, review pull requests. These are the majority decisions that are made in the Turing way. You've then also heard today from a few of the working groups. And what we do is think about those as being sort of maintainer level. The reason that you have working groups is because there is a level of complexity to the types of work that happen that isn't possible to do just in a GitHub issue um, alone. And the main key there is that the, the maintainer groups, the working groups require some longer term engagement and they also require some more specialized expertise. Um, and so to be very clear, these four circles that I've drawn on the slide uh, represent the current four different working groups. And they are, I would consider everyone in those working groups to be maintainers, but you are not um, all the same ma maintainers. So you have a, essentially you can think about the model as being like a specialized maintainer for uh, translation and localization, accessibility, infrastructure, the book dash. And then at the very top level, at the top level of that wedge of the triangle, are project leaderships. We've called them a constitutional level. I'm super open to other words to sort of label that top level. And these are decisions that require knowledge of the whole project and over a much longer time frame. And at the moment, Malvika and I are co-leading the project. And so we are kind of the people who make those constitutional leadership decisions. Now, the proposed mechanism that I'd love to hear your thoughts on is that we have regular meetings where actually we convene the chairs of the working groups as well as myself and Malvika, and together we make the decisions. And what that does is it gives us the opportunity to have pathways in to joining the working groups and representation from working groups at leadership and therefore having just a bit more of a clear sort of um, pathway for how your, your considerations, your input goes up into those decisions. And then I'm flipping the arrows around on this slide. And because you've got that representation from working groups at leadership, you also are bringing back, the chairs will be bringing back some of that context into the maintainer, into the working groups. And one of the things that the uh, I would, I'd say the all of the working groups are doing well, but actually I think the the translation and localization have, been, have really been leading on this and doing it really really fantastically well, is making sure that where they have made decisions and where they are sort of thinking about governance, they are also feeding that back into the community. So we have this real sort of bi-directional flow um, of of input and learning across the project. So. Um, I don't know why my uh, little boxes have got a little bit messed up here, but this last slide says thank you to all of you. Thank you to everyone in the working groups. Thank you for everyone for being here. And what questions or suggestions do you have? We have a question, first question coming from Jim. Um, Jim, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested in the, at the constitutional level, uh, I don't know if this has been decided or whether this is sort of open, but the the sort of involvement of working group chairs, 
are we imagining that that's sort of like they have a vote and is that equal to sort of people at the constitutional level or is it maybe more like a advisory role so that there's sort of ultimately some very small group who sort of makes that kind of high level decision but they there's a structured way for them to get advice from people who might be a bit closer to what's going on in the in the working groups so I, that hasn't been decided for sure um i think my my feeling is that getting to a point where we're sort of actually kind of identifying the types of decisions that need to be made at that level is sort of the first exercise to then being able to say, should it be a vote or should it be something that is kind of advisory? One of the bigger points is the entanglement of budget, for example. So I have a role where I'm programme director at the Turing Institute and I have a responsibility over the budget for the programme. And that overlaps in at the moment quite a non-transparent way with how we make decisions related to the Turing way and so I think probably what will happen is that as we start to sort of like have have more interrogation of those decisions I think it will help us to kind of clarify which are decisions being made as at the constitutional level of the project or which are decisions that are being made um by sort of me as program director at the Turing Institute that are feeding in to the open source project that is the Turing way. So lots of things that are still open. And I think my preference is I would quite like to try and sort of explore and, and sort of see what types of conversations come up before putting in place a kind of formalized, you know, voting or advisory. Because I, I think my suspicion is that some things we could vote on and quite a lot, my suspicion is that we probably would not end up voting on. Um, but that's a that's a that's a big exploration space and very, very important to do. I have a question for the working groups, and it's related to the support that you would like to get from both Anne and myself. And because I from what I understand, the maintainer group, the maintainer and the book dash the sorry, the, the working groups would be as autonomous as possible. Uh, so having that in mind, how do you envision, what do you, what would you like, which type of support would you like to get from, from us? I mean, Anne and myself are here to support the community. So if I can just hear a couple of ideas from the working groups, that would be really valuable. Just to flag you, I've written that question in the pad, um, if you'd, like to take a moment to think and answer in written form. It's on line 111 as well. Richard, I also see in the chat, um, maybe I ask about uh, the, the naming, maybe perhaps using strategic over constitutional. Is that a question you'd like to, to ask Kirsty maybe about the the naming process. Uh, sure, yeah. I, I mean, I was just it was a pretty broad um notion. I mean, the the constitution kind of implies a sort of um uh, a narrow set of core rules almost, um, which is slightly different from like setting a broad direction for a project, but I mean, yeah, it's a, a semantic question, it doesn't really matter. Thanks, Richard. No, definitely all matters. I, I saw Kirsty. I don't know if you want to chime in verbally, but also I saw your note in the chat as well. Yeah, it's just it's a it's a word that we'll kind of as people sort of make suggestions, we can we can iterate towards. I I I find the um the leftover parts of things that are not strategic to be quite nerve wracking. I don't like the idea of suggesting that the community level and the maintainer level are not contributing strategically. So that's my concern about literally using the word strategic. Um, but I, you know, it, there are lots of, there are pros and cons with all the various different words, basically. So all suggestions, uh, we can, we can do that together.
Go for it, Tim. I've got something a bit like a answer to Ali's question. And I don't, I'd be interesting to know if this is like a nice answer and maybe even to hear back from you and Anne. But I think, um, I would say without, without you and Anne, my guess is the infrastructure working group wouldn't exist. And I think you sort of reached out and identified people and everyone was excited. And, and in general, I feel like a lot of the VMA meetings is we're really enthusiastic and we want to do stuff, but we're all actually sort of quite busy. And it sort of occurs to me that having someone there who we can rely on to say, hey, you've all got a meeting and to nudge us and keep track of things, it feels a bit like it removes a barrier that we we don't have to um I don't know, I wouldn't say that we don't have to be so organized um, that we can we can bring our, our knowledge and skills and and whatever, but uh it feels like less of a burden and commitment to me knowing that I've got someone there to sort of push a nudge and say we've got meetings and we need to make decisions and, and copy us into things. But I don't know if that's, it feels a bit like that's giving someone a bad task because you're sort of saying, look after us. Um, and like, <laughs> I don't know, do the paperwork and the admin stuff, but, but that is really, really helpful. And it, it does mean we can just sort of focus on the sort of more deep thinking and thinking about what, what skills we have that are most valuable to bring. I just, I just put my hand up to say that um, one, actually, I think that's that's one of the reasons why we have the Turing Institute backing this project because we can have people who are paid to do some of that sort of quote unquote support work, and I think if you're looking at sort of bringing volunteers, expert volunteers in, from a purely kind of capitalistic project management point of view, having them use their time for the key points that we need their expertise on is, is the most important sort of aspect. So I think, I, I don't think, I think it's great that your answer is basically the thing that we're already doing. <laughs> and I think that's really wonderful. Um, and I, I, I'm delighted and I think it's not, it's not by mistake. Do you know what I mean? This is actually something that kind of, we want to make sure is, is really working and can I just uh, encourage everyone to do a little um, give a little round of applause emoji burst for Ali and for Anne who really have been supporting all of the working groups and doing a really fantastic fantastic job of it so thank you everyone very thank you from everyone very very much you are you are doing a really fantastic job thank you Thanks, also, everyone. just while there isn't another question, I think one of the things that um, would one of the, the tensions with the sort of just building a bit on on Jim's point, there's a distinction between the person who sort of takes the notes and puts them on GitHub, for example, and the person or people who kind of gets to the decision part. And I think one of the things that I'm really excited about with sort of formalizing the working groups a little bit more is, is allowing space for conversations, but it is not the role of Anne and Ale to make the decision. What they do very, very well is create an environment that brings together these, you, the experts, where you can take decisions. And I think that's the best use of your time it's a really powerful way of informing me, Malvika, others across the project, the, the community. Um, and as we sort of figure out, as we start to kind of formalize making the um making these these decisions in an issue, uh under a sort of proposal or under a re request for comment, uh, we will start to sort of figure out which of these can be made at which level. 
And that's one of the things that I've been really enjoying coming along to the infrastructure working group conversations to, is to say, that sounds like a decision that you can't make, but you can ask the quote unquote constitutional level, the strategic level to make on your behalf. So you can put a request up to say, can you can can you please discuss this? We it's a blocker for us. We need you to kind of come down with a decision on it. Or there may be ones. There was one, for example, where we we discussed uh, infrastructure for a newsletter, and the infrastructure working group said, "You don't need. We 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 are not giving an opinion on that because it's it's outside of our our scope." And that is also a great decision so all of these decisions including the say including saying we are not going to take a decision or that we are not the right people to make a decision on that or we need someone else's input they're just really really powerful ways of sort of demonstrating how decisions are made and bringing people in That is such a perfect way to round up the discussion around decision making um, in the project. Thanks so much, Kirsty. I think in the seven minutes that we have left, I'm very sensitive to time. Um, so maybe in the meantime, I could, uh, I encourage anyone that has any other questions to maybe add them in a written way to the chat um, or to the pad. Um, but I'll pass it to, to Malvika if you'd like to close us off with a discussion around our five year anniversary. Okay, let's see what my internet looks like, but um, I have very important information to share and I'll try to make it as exciting as I think it is. So, um, and can you say, share the link in the chat for Liz specifically? So if I don't describe something, uh, she has access? Of course. Um, so the project, of course, you all know what the Turing Way is. What I am uh, here to tell you that we are in the fifth year. We are finishing the fifth year of the Turing Way. The Turing Way was launched in 2019 at the collaboration workshop of Software Sustainability Institute with three chapters with 12 to 13 contributors. I know I'm missing someone in here. Um, and we are now over 450 co-authors, engaged community, 5,000 monthly readers, collaboration with 50 organizations, governance is development, lots of peer-reviewed article reports, policies, and lots of exciting things that are, that are happening. It's massive. And every time those who have not seen the book come back after six months, the book looks different, the community looks different, the conversation that's happening is very dynamic. And we need to celebrate that, <laughs> really need to celebrate that. Turing is a Turing way is what it is because of you, our community, and we want to we want to mark this year. I want to mark this year, and as the project has become a very important resource for everyone, we want to part together and share a slice of cake, both metaphorically and really. I have a cake here, and I hope you all will have a cake from us this year. So I, again, you know, the part of this transparency is that we don't want to make these kind of decisions, including the fun stuff that we do. We want to know from you how you want to celebrate this fifth year. What should this fifth year's theme would be? Where would you like to take the Turing way? What does the future looks like for you? How we would engage and involve your local community if you think that there are people who should be here, are not here. How can we support you in bringing them in? Please share your thought. We've had some of the conversation in a collaboration workshop, no, no, collaboration cafe, co-working co calls. So we have some, collected some exciting ideas, which I don't want to introduce now because you can go to this issue. And if someone please share the link. Uh, I really want to hear from you um, because we have some ideas of how we can mark this year, but we probably are limited by our own imagination. So we have a few minutes. That's where we can take some random suggestion, ideas, thoughts from you, and that would be a brilliant way to end this call. I hope I did not eat all the seven minutes. Yay, we have four minutes. How should we celebrate this year? <laughs> Let's go to Hawaii. Well, <laughs> I did say we should have a conference in Hawaii, but I don't think we can afford that, but <laughs> it would be nice.
Ariel. So I have, I have two suggestions. One is we should absolutely get some proper five-year anniversary swag. Definitely stickers. Maybe some kind of, you know, trinket, perhaps. Ever wants t-shirts, Marvika says limited edition. I think more the more ideas for merchandise, the better. We're looking for those hidden badges. Yes. Oh, do you know what, Sarah? Just thinking about it, enamel badges. Oh, my fave. Um, yeah, I contributed to the sharing way. I think like getting contribution stickers or something like that would be amazing. Um, and then the other thing I've completely forgotten what the other thing is. The other thing is um, I'm wondering about the feasibility of um, connecting with the original contributors and soliciting kind of memories or perspectives or, from them on what it would like, you know, their memories of being at that collaborations workshop and setting things up. I know that, that Sarah at the very least is... Yeah, recorded panel discussion. If we can get like the like the OGs in, that would be good. Um, yeah. That that's Ariel, who is our budget manager. So <laughs> she has more power than me to do concrete stuff. So I'm really glad that those are already on the table. I'm very excited about limited edition stickers and gadgets. I think on, on the other side, I would really also like to um, learn a bit more about where the community sees successes that we are not seeing or celebrating enough and find some ways to surface them. Trinket for trinket's sake, basically, yeah. Great, we are left with one minute and I'll pass it to you, Kirsty, to close this off. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for coming along. I'm hoping we can um, have a have more of these community calls. I think uh, I think I'm I'm. It's really lovely to see you all here. I think I was hoping for more people to come, and so I think I'm really really curious for you to send any feedback to us about why you came. Thank you, and what you think we need to do to encourage others to feel that they they have a, a that these are spaces for them to kind of have a voice and to. Um, and to be to feel like a, a meaningful sort of contribution to the community. So so if you have any reflections on that, I'd be really, really curious to hear them. Um, you can ping them on on Slack or you can send them by email or whatever, whatever sort of ping me a carrier pigeon over to Greenwich is totally fine. Um, yeah, just just really thank you so much for being here. Thank you for the hard work. And um, hopefully we'll we'll keep building these up and getting your input as we go along. And happy birthday to us. Holy moly. Not yet, not quite yet. Bye, bye. Take care, Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye. Stop there.